Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Computer Science 150. Uh, so this week, we're going to be talking more about objects. Um, on Friday of last week, I had a, a sort of an introductory talk, starting to introduce some of the basic concepts of working with objects. Uh, today, we're going to continue with that introduction. We're going to look at another example that features the creation of a specialized object to solve a particular problem. Uh, this week's lab, on the other hand, will continue to focus on arrays and methods. Uh, in particular, this week's lab is going to be dealing with two-dimensional arrays and writing some methods to work with two-dimensional arrays. And we'll have lab at the usual time this week on Tuesday and Thursday. Um, and because Wednesday is a day off, we'll just simply have no lecture on Wednesday. All right, and also over the weekend, I graded and returned your work for the midterm exam to you. Uh, one thing I wanted to do at the start of class today is I wanted to show you the solution to one of the two problems from the midterm. Um, so this problem was the um, problem involving writing this method, the smallest divisor method, and then using it to print the list of prime divisors of some number that the user enters. Right, so first of all, the, the smallest divisor method, again, the problem statement says that what this method was supposed to do is supposed to take an integer and then return the smallest number that divides evenly into that integer. All right, and the code here accomplishes that basically by trying a set of different divisors, starting with two and working its way upward from there. Uh, one way to organize this is to use a while loop. Um, the purpose of the while loop is to allow you to look at different divisors until you find one that you would like to stop with. Uh, and the one that we'd like to stop with is the one where the divisor divides evenly into the number. Now, as long as that's not happening, as long as we haven't yet reached a, a number that divides evenly into n, we simply want to keep going. And on each round, we simply would go on to the next possible divisor. Right? And then, presumably, the loop will stop for one of two reasons, either because we make it all the way through to n without finding anything that divides into n, or somewhere along the way, uh, somebody causes this condition to fail. And when this condition fails, it basically means that we found a d that divides evenly into n, and that's the d that we want to return. All right, so that's the logic of the smallest divisor method uh, designed to search through all possible divisors until we come across the first one that divides evenly into n. All right, then another aspect of this problem is figuring out how to use that method to solve the bigger problem. The bigger problem is to take a number and print all of its divisors, all of its prime divisors. All right, that's a little bit more subtle and here's the logic that does that uh, in the main method. Uh, what we're going to be doing here is going to be setting up a loop. And on each round through the loop, we're going to call the smallest divisor method to answer the question, can you find a small number that divides into n? Right? And then as soon as we find such a number, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to print it. Because obviously, anytime you find a divisor, that's something that you'll want to print. And then finally, the, the somewhat subtle thing to do is that once we find a divisor that divides into n, we go ahead and divide it out. And that produces a new smaller value of n. So that basic, that step of taking your divisor and dividing it out of the number means that on the next round, you won't find that same divisor again, unless, of course, that divisor is repeated in the number. Uh, if there is a number with a repeated divisor, this logic will find it by simply finding it multiple times. And eventually, when you divide that divisor out enough times, it disappears from the number. All right, so that's the logic I was looking for here. I was basically looking for some way to use the smallest divisor method in the context of a loop where you repeatedly call that method. And in the process, you find and print all of the divisors of the number that the user has entered. OK, so that is the, the solution to that problem. Um, and a little logistical issue here is that I'm not going to be posting this solution to the course website. 
the reason for that is I may in the future want to uh, use this as an exam problem in a future exam. And for that reason, I won't be posting the solution publicly. However, if you would like a copy of this solution, just send me an email and I'll be happy to send you a copy of my solution to this problem. Okay, any questions about that solution before we go on to today's lecture? Okay, so in today's lecture, we're gonna be continuing to talk about objects and uh, the main example that I brought along for you to look at today uh, is an example where we're going to be constructing a somewhat larger and more complex object and before we dive into the specifics of this object let me go ahead and run the program associated with this object so you can see what the program does. Uh, the purpose of this program is to implement a simple guessing game uh, and the, the way that the guessing game works is that when we start up the game, uh, the software will basically pick a number at random, and it's our job to guess what that number is. Right now, uh, the way the game is played is basically played in a series of rounds, and in each round, you can enter a guess for what you think that number is. All right, and each time you enter a guess, the uh, game will respond by telling you whether your guess is too high or too low and then it will give you another chance to guess the number. So the idea is that we're gonna do a series of repeated guesses here in the hopes that we um, zero in on the number we're looking for before we get to the end of the number of allowed guesses here. All right, so now, and I believe that the way that the game is set up is that you're allowed a maximum of five guesses before the game ends. Um, so let me see if I can if I can get this here. Uh, let's see. Let's guess 42. Too low. Let's try 46. Okay. So um, in this case, we we after a total of four guesses, I managed to guess it correctly, um, and it basically prints a confirmation message saying that I guessed correctly. Um, and then also the the main program that we're running here runs two versions of the game: a harder version where the number falls between one and one hundred, and then an easier version where the number falls between one and twenty five. So let's play the easier game. Um, okay, so that's the the purpose of the game is to basically give you several chances to guess a random number that the, the game itself has generated for you to try and guess. And on each round, it will tell you whether your guess is too high or too low. All right, so this whole process is going to be run by an object. Um, and the main point in today's example is to demonstrate a more complex example of a class uh, that has a number of additional features beyond the most basic things that we looked at in the example on Friday. All right, so first of all, the first thing to look at whenever you look at any example of a class is to start by looking at the so-called member variables. All right, and as I, as I told you in the, in the lecture on Friday, member variables are special variables in a class uh, that are distinct from the other variables. And the first thing that makes them different is that these variables are declared in the class itself and they're not declared within the context of any method. All right now, a somewhat more technical term that's used for these member variables is we frequently say that the purpose of these member variables is to store what's called state information. Um, if you have an object which is representing an activity like a game, uh, one common feature that all games have is games have what is called game state. Um, this is basically the current configuration of the game, and it includes any information that is relevant about the game that you would need to save from one round of the game to the next. All right, and in this example, there are three pieces of state information that the game needs to store. Uh, the first is a Boolean variable that simply records whether or not the game has ended. Um, at start, uh, that game over variable will be set to false, and then as soon as the user either manages to guess the number correctly or they run out of guesses, uh, we'll switch this variable over to true. All right, so that's the first relevant piece of state information, simply asking, is the game still in, in play or has it ended? 
Then for this particular game, the most important piece of state information is the secret number. Uh, this is going to be generated at the start when the game starts up. And then of course, the purpose of the player is to guess what that secret number is. And the other relevant piece of state information uh, in this game is the, the number of guesses that the user has had, because there's an upper limit on how many times you can guess. And if you uh, reach that upper limit without having guessed the number, the game will automatically declare the game to be over. Okay, so these are three relevant pieces of state information. And as in any class we look at, these member variables are going to play an essential role. Just about everything going on in the class is going to be interacting with these member variables in some significant way. All right, now after the member variables, the next thing that you will typically see in a class is constructors. Uh, and in this particular example, we actually have two different constructors. Uh, remember from the lecture on Friday, uh, the way that you can tell that a method is a constructor is that its name exactly matches the name of the class, and also it has no return type. All right, and in this example, what we're going to see is we're also going to see that you can have more than one constructor uh, depending on different scenarios under which you would want to create one of these objects. Uh, the first constructor here, the one that has no parameters, this is, this is commonly referred to as the default constructor. And the second constructor here, which does have a parameter, allows you to create the object uh, along with some extra information that you're going to provide when you call this constructor. Right now, the purpose of both of these constructors is to initialize the member variables. Right? And that's what you're going to see happening in both constructors. Uh, we have three member variables that need to be initialized, and it's the job of these constructors to set those member variables to reasonable starting values. Okay, now, reasonable starting value for the game over member variable is simply set that equal to false, because once, the, once we start up the game and it starts going, uh, the game is certainly not yet over. Also, another reasonable starting value for the number of guesses is, of course, zero, because at beginning, before the user has had any chance to make any guesses, the number of guesses they've made is obviously zero. All right, and finally, the last thing we need to do is we need to have some mechanism for generating the random number. Uh, in the case of the default constructor, the random number is going to be generated in the range from 1 to 100. In the case of the second constructor, one difference in the second constructor is it will allow us to specify a range that the random number should fall in. And in that case, what we're going to do is we're going to generate a secret number that falls in the range from one up to whatever that range number is. All right, so that will allow you to uh, uh, do a little bit of customization in terms of setting up the game. You can basically pick the size of the range in which the random number falls and that will make the game either easier or harder as the game gets played. All right, and then another thing to, to remember when we're talking about constructors is uh, how you actually call these constructors. Uh, to see an example of that, what we have to do is switch over to a second class that I've put in this example. Um, the purpose of the second class simply is just to give us a place to put the main method. And in the main method is where you're going to see these game objects being created, all right? And again, here's the, the, the most important piece of code uh, when you are working with objects. And this is the code that actually declares an object variable and then physically creates the object by, by using the new operation, all right? And in this example, because there are two different constructors, which means that there's two different ways to make a game object, I have two examples of two different ways to make a game object. Uh, in the first example, we're using the so-called default constructor. And when you do that, you get a game where the random number falls in the range from 1 to 100. And in the second example, um, I'm creating a second game object. And for this one, I'm calling the second constructor, the one that has a parameter. And the parameter there is uh, allowing us to specify the range that the secret number falls in. In this case, I chose 25 for the range, which means that the secret number for the second game will fall instead in the range from one to 25, all right? Those are two examples of how you would use those constructors to create different game objects for different circumstances. Okay, and again, 
uh, these ideas, member variables and constructors, these are all ideas that I talked about in some length in the lecture on Friday. Um, so again, this is mostly review uh, in terms of the role of those two important things in a class. Okay, now the thing that we're going to focus on today is the rest of the code that you see here in the game class. And what we're going to be seeing now is we're going to be seeing some examples of methods that we're going to be adding to the class. All right, again, the first thing to notice about these methods is that in their declarations, you don't see the static keyword. That means that these are so-called non-static or just simply ordinary methods in the class. And whenever you write such a method, the primary purpose of these methods is to basically allow you to interact in various ways with the member variables that are stored inside the object. All right, so here we have a list of three member variables that you could potentially interact with, and you're gonna see each one of these methods interacting with those member variables in some way. Uh, the first method is a very simple method. Its purpose is simply to answer a question. Um, a question we may have at various points along the way is, is the game over? Uh, and to ask that question, there's a method here called simply is game over, which returns a Boolean. It's going to return either true or false to you, depending on whether or not the game is over. And in this case, we can answer the question simply by looking at one of the member variables directly. Um, there is already a member variable called game over, uh, which stores precisely the information we're interested in. So all we have to do is access that member variable and return its current value to answer this question, is the game over? Okay, now when you see this method, you may ask, um, couldn't someone answer this question by simply going directly to the member variable and looking to see what value it has? Well, the reason that, that you can't do that is I did one other thing a little bit different with these member variables, and that is each one of the three member variables that you see here is declared private. Now, as soon as you do that, as soon as you declare a member variable private, that basically means that it is impossible for somebody to reach directly into the object and access those member variables. Instead, as soon as member variables are private, you have to use a more indirect route, and that more indirect route always involves using a method instead. Now, in this case, if you want to answer the question, is the game over, and if you're blocked from accessing the game over variable directly, you have to answer that question indirectly by setting up a method that effectively allows you to see the value of that variable. Right? And because the method itself is declared public, that means that anybody who wants to can call this method. And since this method has access to any of the member variables, uh, it can access the required information and return the information to you. Right? That's why you have to uh, go sort of a more indirect route to access the game over member variable because the game over member variable is private. You can't access it directly. So what you have to do instead is you have to call a method that does have access to the member variable and can answer your question for you. All right, and you'll see the is game over method playing a role in the game itself uh, because here in main, each time we create a game object, the next thing we'll do is we'll drop into a loop, and the test in that loop basically makes use of that method. Uh, each time, uh, the test will talk to the game object and ask the game object, is the game over? And if, as long as the game is not over, we want to keep playing, and that then forms the test in the while loop that basically keeps playing the game until the object tells us that the game has ended. Right, that's a typical application of that method. Okay, and then the, the last and most complex method we have here is the, the guess method. Um, as you can guess, the purpose of this method is to allow somebody to make a guess for what the random number is. Right? So this method has a parameter whereby you can pass in your guess. Um, this method will take in that guess and use it to update the state of the game. All right, and it's going to be doing that with a fairly complex arrangement of if else statements because there's a number of things you have to think about as soon as somebody gives you a guess. And in some of these cases, you're going to end up changing the state of the game. 
And in some cases, you're also going to end up printing some messages, right? And all of that activity is going to be taking place in this method here. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is we have to protect ourselves from an, what is essentially an illegal situation. And that is, if you try to guess at a time when the game is already over, or the user has already exceeded their number of guesses, uh, the only reasonable thing to do on that point is simply to reject the guess. Um, so in that case, all we're, all we're going to do is we're going to print a message saying, sorry, the game's already over. Uh, you can't guess again. I'm not going to accept the guess that you just made. All right, now, if that's not the case, uh, that basically means that the game is still in progress. So that means that we, uh, this is a legitimate opportunity for somebody to guess. And the next question we're going to ask is, did the user guess correctly? Uh, we do that simply by comparing the value of their guess against the secret number that's stored in one of the member variables. And if those two match, uh, we're going to print a message saying that this, this guess was correct. And we're also going to change the game state by flipping the game over member variable to true. Uh, that then will indicate that uh, with, a, with a correct guess, the game is now ended and any future attempts to guess will be rejected because the game has already reached the game over state. All right, and then the final case basically corresponds to the situation where the game is still active and this most recent guess that the user made was not the correct guess. Uh, the last thing to do in that case is to basically give the user some feedback and to update our state. All right, so the first thing we have to do is give them a little bit of feedback uh, telling the user whether or not their guess was high or low. And for that, we'll simply guess, we'll compare their guess against the secret number. And if it's low, we'll print a message saying that the guess was too low. And if it's high, we'll print a message saying that the guess was too high. All right, and then regardless of which message, message we print, the next thing to do is to update the game state by increasing the number of guesses that the user has made. And then each time we bump up the number of guesses, we also have to check to see if we've reached the end of the game. All right, in this case, the limit on number of guesses is 10. If you make it um, up to 10 guesses without having correctly guessed the number, uh, we'll declare the game over. At that point, we'll print a message saying that you've used up all of your guesses and we'll flip the game over state to true. All right, so it's a rather complex method, but it captures all of the rules of the game and it captures all of the game activity uh, that we need to, to carry out. All right, and then finally, to see this guess method in, in action, we'll have to flip over to the main method uh, and see how that actually gets used. Uh, again, the way that this is going to get used is we're gonna go through a series of rounds in the game, and each round, we're gonna prompt the user to enter a guess, we're gonna get the guess that they've entered, and then we're gonna pass that guess along to this method, and as soon as the uh, method receives the user's guess, it's gonna give you some feedback, it's gonna print some messages, and it's gonna update the internal state of the game uh, so you can go on to the next round. Okay, so that is the uh, guessing game example. And again, the, the new feature that you see here is the addition of methods uh, that will allow you to interact with the internal state of the object and update it as you go along. And the, most of the use of this object involves calling those methods to get useful things done, right? So in this example, once we've created a game object, uh, we're gonna basically, through a series of rounds, we're gonna be calling the isGameOver method and the guess method to physically carry out the game and to do the, the necessary actions of the game. Okay, so let's pause here and ask if anybody has any questions about either how the game is played here in the main method or the code that you saw in the, uh, in the two methods in the game class. Okay, so this is, uh, this is, if you like, this is essentially our first example of a more or less complete class that has all of the key features that classes will need to have. We've now have seen an example with member variables that store relevant state information, uh, constructors that are designed to initialize that state information, uh, 
and most important of all, a collection of methods that allow you to interact with that state information and uh, update it and basically carry out the main activity that the object is designed to carry out. Okay, now in the lab coming up next week, uh, on lab seven, you're gonna be doing something similar. You're going to be writing a fairly simple class, which is gonna be similar in setup to the class that you see here. And you're gonna be getting some practice writing methods. And then finally, the last thing you're gonna be getting some practice on is writing code that actually calls those methods to accomplish some task. All right, so that's, this now is, it basically concludes the introduction to objects. Um, and of course, you may be wondering at this point, this is, uh, this is now essentially week six of the course, and we have a full four weeks left to go. Uh, what, are we, what are we going to be doing in the remaining four weeks? Well, the story is that with this example, I have now introduced the last major topic that we're going to be introduced to in the course. What we're gonna be spending the next few weeks doing is gradually doing bigger and more complex and more sophisticated things with objects, All right? And starting with a lecture on Friday, what we're going to start to see is we're going to start to see examples that feature more than one class and that, start, that you'll start to see examples that feature interactions between objects. All right. And what we're going to be doing over the remaining weeks of the term is we're gradually going to be making our examples more and more complex. All right. And one measure of the complexity of each example is how many different classes are involved. All right. So with today's example, which is a fairly basic example, we're basically only working with a single class and interacting with that single class. In the example that I'll be showing you on Friday, we'll be starting to look at examples where we interact with a couple of classes that basically interact with each other to get some job done. And we're gradually gonna scale up the size of our programs as we go through the remainder of the term so that by the time we get to the end of the term, we're gonna be looking at more complex examples where we have um, four or five different classes that need to be built, and these classes will interact with each other with, in progressively more complex ways. All right, so that's what we're going to be spending our time doing for the remainder of the term. Uh, basically, for the next four weeks, we're going to be working an awful lot with the concept of objects, and as we go along, we're gradually going to scale up the examples so that uh, in the examples, we're going to be seeing more and more classes that interact with each other in more and more complex ways. And that's what we'll be, we'll be spending the remainder of the term doing. Okay, now, because we do have a little bit of time left today, uh, I want to get a little bit of a head start on the lecture that's coming up on Friday. And one of the things that we're gonna be doing in the lecture on Friday is we're gonna, we're gonna be start using some classes that have already been built for us. And one of the classes that we're gonna be working with in the example on Friday is a very useful class called the Java ArrayList class. So for the last 15 minutes of today's lecture, I want to give you a quick introduction to this class and um, we'll then make use of that class in the example that I show you on Friday. Okay, so first of all, what is an array list? Uh, the first thing to say about the array list is the array list is an example of one of the classes that is already provided for your use in Java. Uh, Java has an extremely large collection of classes called the Java class library. And in many cases, when you're writing a Java program and you imagine the need for a class to do some job, in many of those cases, there's already a class in the Java class library that can do that job for you, All right? So the array list is an example of one of those classes. This comes from the Java class library. Um, specifically, you'll find it in the package java.util. So when you get ready to use one of these array lists in your program, the first thing you'll be doing is you'll be writing an import statement. You'll be saying import java.util.arraylist. All right, now, next, what is an array list? Well, an array list is basically an, a, a class which is de designed to give you a fancier and more capable replacement for the Java array concept. Okay, now we've been working quite a bit already with arrays, and 
uh, and I hope the sense that you're starting to get is that arrays are extremely useful things to have in Java programs, uh, because for one thing, arrays give you the ability to store large lists of data. And if you're, if you're going to be writing a program that is gonna process large amounts of data, uh, arrays are the natural choice for that. Now, having said that though, um, there are one or two limitations of arrays that basically will motivate us for, to want to get something better than the standard array. Uh, the most important limitation of the standard Java array is that when you create it, you have to specify how large it is. And then once you make that specification, that size is fixed. Um, once you create a Java array, it basically gives you space for a certain number of data items. And if you decide later that you need more space, uh, what you're essentially going to have to do is you're going to have to create another larger array and copy all of the data over from the old array to the new array. Right now, especially in applications where you don't know in advance exactly how much data you're going to have to work with, and you may have to repeatedly go through that process of resizing an array as you go along, especially in a scenario like that, you're going to want something a little bit more flexible than the standard Java array. And that is the ultimate motivation for this class. It's called the ArrayList class. And one of the main selling points of this ArrayList class is that it gives you what is essentially a flexible list. Um, what typically happens when you make an ArrayList is when you create the object, you are basically creating an empty list that has nothing in it. Now, the ArrayList class will have methods that will allow you to add new data items to the list. And one of the most important tricks that the ArrayList can do is as you add more data to the list, it automatically resizes itself to accommodate any data that comes along. All right, and that's a, that's a trick that ordinary arrays can't do, and that's one of the main selling points in ArrayList. They're capable of automatically resizing themselves each time you add more data to the ArrayList. Okay, now here are some of the basics of how you set up and use an array list. Uh, the first is the basic mechanics of creating an array list object. Um, as I've said already, the, the operation in Java that creates a new object is the new operation. And when you use the new operation, you have to say uh, what object you're going to be creating. And in the, in the case of the array list, there's one additional spe special piece of information that we have to provide. And that is when we start putting data into the array list, we have to describe what kind of data we're planning to put into the array list. And the way that we do that is with a special notation, it's called the template notation. And after the name of the class inside brackets, we're expected to put a type. And this will basically describe what type of thing we are eventually planning to put into this array list. All right, so in the, in the example that we're looking at here, what we're setting up is an array list that will eventually contain a collection of strings. All right, so in that case, the variable type would be array list and inside brackets, we say string. And then likewise, when you create the object with new, you have to say, I'm gonna be making an array list that, it is, that is designed to contain strings. All right, now, the next step is, um, well, actually, hang on a minute, before we get to the next step, uh, there's one sort of bit of special information I need to tell you with regard to choosing the type. Um, and that is, there is a constraint on how the array list operates. And the important constraint is that the type that you put inside brackets must be an object type. It's not allowed to be a primitive type. Um, so for example, if you wanted to create an array list that would hold ints, uh, as soon as you try doing this, Java will flag this as an error because one of the fundamental constraints is that when you set up an array list, the type of thing that you're planning to put into that array list must be an object type, right? Which means that any of the primitive types like int or double, those are illegal for this particular use. All right, now that's kind of a pain because I'm sure you can imagine situations where you may actually want to create an array list of ints or an array list of doubles, well, as a workaround for that situation, uh, the Java people have given us a rather strange workaround, and that workaround is this. 
it turns out that in Java, for every one of the primitive types, like the int type, the Java class library also defines a class which is the object equivalent of that primitive type. Right? So the corresponding class for the int type is the so-called integer class. And because an integer actually is an object, it, this is something that is in fact legal to use in an array list, right? So the workaround for this scenario is that if you wanted to create an array list that will hold ints, what you have to do instead is to create an array list that holds their object equivalents, and these are integers, right? So this will, this is, will be considered legal because an integer is a type of object and you can make an, an array list of integers if you choose to do so. Okay, now the next thing to talk about is the mechanics of adding data items to an array list once you've set up an array list. All right, so here again is an example of an array list that will hold strings. When you set this up at start, it is basically starts out as an empty list. And the primary method that you use to add new data items to the list is not surprisingly called add. Uh, there's a method in the array list called add, and each time you call it, it will add one new object to the list that this thing represents. All right, so the basic mechanics are you set up an empty array list object, and then you repeatedly call the add method on that object to add more data items to the list. All right, and again, the main selling point in the array list is that it's capable of resizing itself automatically each time you add new data to it. So whether you're gonna be adding two items or 2,000 items doesn't matter. Um, each time you call the add method to add another item to, to the list, uh, the array list will simply stick that item at the end of its list and it will automatically resize its list each time a new item gets added to it. Right now, in the case of uh, this weird workaround where you have to use uh, the integer class instead of using ints, that could potentially make the job of adding ints to the list more complicated uh, because if you need to instead add integer objects and instead of adding the integers themselves, that would look more like this. Uh, in each case, what you would actually have to do is you would actually have to create an integer object by taking the int that you want to store and putting that int inside an integer object and then, then in turn adding that to the array list, that technically is the way that you would add ints to a list. All right, now, originally this, this was the way that array list worked and not surprisingly, people complained about this because this is very clunky. Um, this is a very clunky way to uh, manage to get ints into a list uh, by first putting the ints into an object and then in turn putting the object into the array list. This was, a lot of people considered this to be very clunky and very awkward. So eventually what happened is that in later versions of Java, uh, the Java folks gave us a much more natural workaround. And in this case, uh, they basically added a feature that will do some of this for you automatically. Uh, this feature is what's called auto boxing. And the way that the auto boxing feature works is that if you make an array list that holds integers, and you ask it to add an ordinary int, it will basically do the step of creating the integer for you automatically. So all you simply have to do is simply say directly, I'd like to add the int three, and then behind the scenes, uh, the auto boxing feature will automatically take that int, put it inside an integer object, and then put the integer object into the list the way that you want. All right, that's a little bit more convenient, so now the only thing you need to remember is that when you're setting up the array list in the first place, you do need to remember that this needs to be integer and not int. But once you've set that up correctly, then you can go ahead and add ints the way you would like, and that looks a lot more, uh, more convenient and more natural. Okay, so again, short pause for questions. Does anybody have any questions about the, the mechanism for adding items to a list? Okay, now the next thing you'll want to do is once you've added a bunch of items to the list, you'll need to want to access those items. Um, and for that, uh, the, um, uh, the ArrayList class offers a corresponding method. It's called simply the get method. 
Uh, the way that the get method works is it basically allows you to go to an array list and, and ask the array list to give you the item that sits at a particular location. Right? And the indexing system that the get method uses is exactly the same indexing system that ordinary arrays use. Uh, the first item in an array list is always going to be item zero. Second item is going to be item one and so on and so forth. All right. So in this example here, I made an array list of integers. I put a couple of integers into the array list. And then when I call the get method with index one, I'm going to be getting back the second number in the list, right? So that will look up the 15 and allow me to access the 15 that is in that particular location. All right, and the flip side of the get method is that there is also a set method. Um, the way the set method works is you give it a combination of an index and a value, and it then replaces the thing at that location with the value that you specified. All right, so in, this, in the example here at the bottom, I set up an array list of integers. I put three integers into the list. Uh, the thing that was at location zero was the number three, but then later by using the set method, I was able to replace that number three with the new number 22. All right, so by using some combination of the get and set methods, you can then access the actual data items in the array list and you can interact, interact with them um, in much the same way that you would interact with elements in an array. And again, the indexing system works exactly the same here that it does in an array. All right, and finally, uh, a last important method, which is going to be important whenever you start writing loops associated with array lists, is that each array list has a size method that will tell you how many items are in the list. And of course, you'll typically need to use that when you're writing a loop that's designed to go across all of the items in the list. All right, so here you see us using a combination of a loop and the get method to basically fetch the individual items that appear in a list and then print them uh, as a series of messages. Okay, so that is now the set of all of the important methods that we're going to need to, to know about in order to work with array lists. Uh, we have an add method for putting new items in the list. We have a set method for replacing existing items with alternative things. And we have a get method to allow us to fetch items that are in the list. All right, and with those three methods, we now have a complete replacement for ordinary Java arrays. And again, the main advantage that array lists bring to all of this is this automatic resizing feature. Uh, they're very useful in situations where you don't know exactly how many data items you're going to need to work with. Uh, you'll want something that starts out as an empty list and allows you to add as many items as you want. And as you add more items, it will automatically resize itself to accommodate everything that you're doing. Okay, so that is the array list class. Any final questions about the array list class um, before we go on to the, to the lecture on Friday? Okay, well, if not, don't forget, we still have lab this week. Uh, the lab this week will be focusing on arrays and methods. Um, and I've already posted the lab materials if you'd like to get an advanced look at what we're doing in this week's lab. Um, and I will look forward to seeing all of you uh, in the lab, either on Tuesday or Thursday of this week. All right, so until then, so long, everybody.